Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Here for Good, where we explore how transformational leaders create a positive impact on the world around them. Throughout history, inspirational leaders and organizations have always used the power of words to connect with emotion, galvanize communities, and enlist others in causes for change and good. At Virtua Health, we are changing the way people think and talk about health and well-being. So it is our privilege to tee up meaningful conversations with engaging social catalysts and thought leaders. Please welcome our host, Dennis Pullen, President and CEO of Virtua Health, as he sparks today's exciting conversation. Donald Norcross has been serving South Jersey for the past decade in the state General Assembly and Senate, and since November of 2014 in Congress. While he's worked hard on behalf of workers and issues such as education and the environment, like the rest of us, his days are now consumed with the coronavirus pandemic. Congressman, welcome to Here for Good. Well, it's great to be here, Dennis. Thanks for the invitation. You know, I can't help but but ask, right now, information on the coronavirus has been evolving at such a rapid pace, which has, has led to a great deal of misinformation about the spread, particularly on social media. You know, how can people sort of sort through all of this to determine if they're actually getting accurate information or factual information? Well, certainly you look at media over the last 20 years and see it changed. Uh, reporters could do their work and would have to wait to the next day to hit the print. Now, anybody with a device can go on a platform and social media and say whatever they want. So I think most people understand that you have to take it with a grain of salt. And, it, and it's that instant gratification oh, that absolutely. we all seek anyway. So we're trying to get information as quickly as we can. And sometimes we, we go off on sound bites that might not actually be factual. Is that but then the entire uh, coronavirus has relatively new. The only thing that was ever talked about Corona before happened to be with the beer. And now <laughs> people are looking at it and say, I need to understand this. Well, How does it impact my kids and my family? And that's a good point. So you've made a point to connect with all of the healthcare organizations across across South Jersey. What are some of the common messages that you're hearing and also that you're giving? Well, first of all, I think it's important to say we are all in this together. This is not a red state or a blue state issue. This is not Republican or Democrat. This is an issue that affects everybody. And we have to come together so we can work on this and defeat it as one nation. So when we look at that, we want to make sure that it's focused on people. When I say that, it doesn't mean we're not addressing the economic issues. In fact, there's a number of things we're working on. But people are in unprecedented times. I'm not going to work. My kids are not in school. They're shutting down a restaurant. Everything we know has changed. How can you or what can you do to help slow or halt the spread of this virus? We just returned from Washington after passing two very important bills. So we talked to our colleagues from around the country, Washington State, who's being impacted. The idea that early on people looked at this like it's sort of just a flu, no big deal. Maybe a passing yeah. thing. Now they fully understand that making sure that you wash your hands, make sure that you cover your mouth, that you're not in large crowds. You know, those are the basic things we can do each and every day to make sure that we're not helping to spread it. You know, I had someone mention to me the other day, it, it goes back to the things we learned in preschool, you know, washing your hands, covering your mouth. I think what it spoke to was common sense and just exercising good hygiene. And so if we can sort of spread that narrative around, I think everyone would benefit from it. But you, you bring up a real challenge. When people meet, they shake hands, they hug. That's who we are as people. And you saw some real challenge during the presidential uh, press conference where he shook hands and then the next guy wanted you know, to elbow bump him. Right. Because it's, we've been doing it our whole lives. It's going to take a real concentration to change that habit. You know, we're seeing states, including New Jersey, 
take unprecedented actions such as closing non-essential businesses, asking people to not meet in groups of 10 or more. What's your message to people who might be feeling anxiety around these actions? Well, one thing, you have to be caring and compassionate. People have feelings. Many of them are quite scared about this, particularly if they're uh, in a compromised position or a little bit older. But we have to be calm. And we have to come together as that nation I keep talking about. You know, just look in the course of the last five days. It was groups of 500. Then it was groups of 50. And there were groups of 10. And then that social distance. So it's going to be continuing to change as we get more and more information about how the virus is spreading. And more importantly, now that across the tri-state area, casinos, restaurants, we're putting on the brakes where the transmission typically would happen. Does it does it make the the actions that we're trying to put in place in terms of social distancing and meetings of not more than ten people? Is it making it difficult for you as a legislator to do your job? Because I know it's important for you to get out and meet with people in all different areas of the state and also in Washington. How is this impacting you and your colleagues in terms of being able to do the things that you are trying to accomplish? The one-on-one contact, there is no replacement. But we can do other things like we're doing right now. Uh, I've had 52 town hall meetings. We have one scheduled for this week that is canceled, and we're going to change the media. But they need to hear from us, and more importantly, I need to hear from them because what's going to happen to my job? Am I going to get unemployment? Am I going to get sick time? How are we going to make sure that my kids are going to be educated? Because one week I think we could all, you know, we've had the snowstorm and we get through it. This has the very real potential of going on for weeks on end. This is not like a a weather emergency. This is something that will have a, a lasting impact. Which brings me to my next question or comment. Some people have reacted to the coronavirus news by panic buying, um, clearing shelves from the stores, from everything from meat to toilet paper. And I promise you, I still don't understand the whole toilet paper obsession, but hopefully someone will educate me on that. What can the government do to ensure that our supply chains remain intact and people can continue to get the items that they need to hopefully try and diminish or reduce some of the anxiety that we're seeing? Well, there's a couple of things. Let's just talk about the uh, food chain that we have in this country. Uh, Jason Rabbit, who owns uh, several shop rights, has been talking to me off and on over the last two weeks to just educate me on some of the habits that are coming on. We all were accustomed when the storm was coming, big snowstorm, bread and milk. Well, what you're seeing now is people are hearing, well, this could go on for a month. How am I going to do it? So that hoarding is almost a natural reaction. Wakefern is a very large corporation and is doing quite well in restocking. But when you're up over 200%, you're going to have those spikes. So I'll just give you one example of how the market is changing. Lysol spray, the disinfectant, has six different scents. Mm -hmm. They're going to get rid of five of them and just do one one. and do it. And that's happening across the board. But the fact of the matter is when you get that many people until there's a sense of calm, and that's what we talked about in the beginning, you have to be compassionate, you have to be caring, but we have to be calm. But is there anything that you think the government can do to help the situation? Yes, we can give confidence to those who are listening. The focus now is obviously we want to make sure the food is there. The concern right now is not we're going to dry up, but it's our concern now is testing's available with results, that you can make sure that if you do get laid off, that you'll have enough money to take care of your kids that we make sure that the emergency uh, leave is going to be in place. And child care. Oh. So you work for virtual, and you're in so many more hours because of what's going on. Yet school just closed, and I got my 5-year-old and 8-year-old 
and the daycare is not open. So there's a real challenge here. And we're trying to look outside the box, literally stories from around the country. How can we address that? You know, and you're absolutely right. So for me, as a large employer, particularly in the healthcare arena, you know, our concern right now is about testing. Can we provide um, testing, get results back in a timely manner, our supply chain? And then, of course, um, taking care of our workforce um, and our community. What do you think the the main focus of the federal government should be in terms of a response to this pandemic, you know, or what is the federal government's main focus um, in terms of responding to the pandemic? So this is not the first virus that has spread around the world, but it is unique in the way it's impacting us right now. So over the last three years, there has been a cutback on the world response from America. When we saw the Ebola in Africa, we saw so many of our professionals going over there, knowing that if you can halt it there, it doesn't come here. Well, that has changed. And in retrospect, we should not have made those cuts. Uh, we now authorize $1.2 billion to be part of that World Health Organization. That was the piece that we passed back on March 4th, that the money is going into research for the uh, different virus uh, uh, therapies that are being done. Uh, those are the things we can do on the medical side. But we also have to understand there's so many businesses, small, medium, that are going to be negatively impacted. So we have $7 billion in small business loans. That was the first bill we passed immediately to make sure the money was flowing to the medical community to make sure that personal protective equipment. The second one we did was more family focused, that we talked about the testing piece, emergency leave, family leave, which is up to uh, 12 weeks. But it's also about those children who will still get the uh, lunch that they were provided in school, but they won't be eating at school, that SNAP benefits, student meals, and the one that's not having a lot of conversations, how many seniors go to different groups each and every day, have lunch, have activities? We would include them in our definition of a vulnerable population, knowing that we have to sometimes take unusual steps in ensuring that they get the care and services they need. So you're absolutely spot on when you say, um, our our kids, which is our, our youngest, and our our seniors, which are also very vulnerable. Yeah, well. they have the physical side and then their limitations to get around. So we're talking about how do we deliver to them on a mass basis. The food banks are also part of this equation, making sure that they get additional resources. Yeah. One, you know, all of this has many people asking the same question. When will we get back to a, quote, normal life? What would you tell them? Just reflect back on your own personal life when something tragic has happened or a real challenge. Nothing will ever be the same again, but we learn by it. So obviously, as we see these things coming up in the future, and by all indications by the professionals, there'll be another time. We'll be better prepared. We'll look at it much further out the road because right now we're trying to get caught up. And that's probably the biggest lesson. 9-11, when it hit, we're not the same nation, but we've been educated. So this being a major election year, what impact do you think what we are going through as a nation today what impact will it have on sort of the electoral process? Do you think people will be as engaged, more engaged, less engaged? Do you think, well, I, I know some states are delaying uh, many things when you look at things such as just the, the election polls, you know, how people will engage. Tell me or just share with me some of your thoughts in terms of how you think our electoral process may be impacted by what we're dealing with today. Well, we're the great democracy. We choose our leaders through an election process. 
So the president, third of the Senate, and all the House will be elected uh, come November. Between now and then, we're going through the primary process, and you've seen some states delay. Others say we can continue because you don't always have to go to the voting booth. There's vote by mail, which is increasing exponentially across South Jersey. So if you think this is going to continue, I would suggest that anybody vote by mail. Get it done early so you don't get caught by that. But it's also part of who we are. We vote. That's your voice. And that has to continue. We'll obviously have to adapt to some of the situations, but we don't have the luxury of not, not being a democracy. Democracy. Exactly. So I'm going to throw you a little curveball here for a minute. So one of the things that I like to ask my, my guests, what would your 18-year-old self say about who you have become today? <laughs> he wouldn't <laughs> believe it. Uh, I, I ask the question quite often when you were coming out of high school and what you thought you were going to do, and uh-huh. what, are you doing it today? And very few people are. Uh, never in my wildest dreams did I think I would have the honor of serving in Washington for the first district of New Jersey. What did what did eighteen year old Donald think? He wasn't doing a lot of thinking. <laughs> the seventies were very good to me. Um, my brothers went to college. I, I enjoyed working with my hands, so uh, I took a very different route. I went to the other four year school. I went to an apprenticeship, became an electrician. As I like to say, there's two hundred fourteen lawyers in Congress. I'm the only electrician. <laughs> it's about that diversity right, that right. I've been through. But uh, has has that influenced how you think about things that you have to weigh in on in Congress when as you think about that entire group or workforce that you know went a different route? Does it allow you to think proactively about encouraging? Uh, not everybody is is built to go to college, but that doesn't mean they can't be educated and can't pick up a skill and do an apprenticeship. Does that become part of your ongoing narrative supporting those types of um, um, I can't. It, it comes into play so often. So I'm on the Armed Services Committee and Labor and Education. I've been laid off. I've been on disability. I was that guy, single dad, trying to find daycare. So when we have those conversations now, I remind them how important a job is. Because one of the first questions you ask somebody when you meet them, what do you what do? do? You do? Yeah. They're proud of what they do, but you need to be able to take care of your family and have hope. It's not about the sheepskin on the wall, which are very important to some. But you know what? When my kids were born, I didn't know if they wanted to go to college, build the college, or defend the college. We need all three, and they're of equal value. Well, Congressman, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us about, one, the coronavirus pandemic. You know, we're all in uncharted waters, and our listeners appreciate you offering clarity on this evolving situation. It's it's important for all of us to know that as a nation, um, we will get through this, and it just gives us an opportunity to come out on the other end better off. We're here for good, and I just want to say thank you and the other hospital systems who are working together. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Here for Good. If you liked what you heard, please leave us feedback and share our podcast link with others. Until next time, be well, everyone.